Uh, joining me today and we're gonna give you a little bit of context on what's going on with all of this marketplace lending stuff and we're gonna have a great opportunity to learn more about the companies that are joining us here today so I think I'm gonna um, start with a little bit of a round of introductions and I'm gonna let you guys uh, go ahead so Karim is graciously hosting uh, this one and so he's gonna he's gonna begin sure Thank you guys, thank you for having me on this panel. Uh, my name is Kareem Balwani and I work in sales for a financial technology company called Yodli Interactive. Um, we have a whole host of uh, internet tech giants that we power up like Google, PayPal and Amazon that use our API and a lot of disruptive startups like Cabbage, OnDeck and Personal Capital uh, that use our API as well uh, to verify account ownership and, and balance uh, transactions. Uh, so that's uh, what I work on uh, day to day and I'm um, happy to be on this panel and uh, yeah, looking forward to uh, seeing some innovative uh, things come out of our API as well as all of uh, the discussions that we'll have today. Victoria? Hi, I'm Victoria with Cabbage and Cabbage is a data platform that simplifies the lending process um, from one that today is very manual and it takes weeks to get a business loan down to one that's 100% automated, all online, and takes just a couple of minutes to, for small businesses to get an answer. So what we're doing is allowing businesses to use the power of their own data, whether it's accounting data, payroll data, checking account, eBay sales, uh, to get funded um, and do so quickly and then to grow. Awesome. And uh, I'm Doug Glebda. I'm the founder and CEO of LendingTree. Um, we're a loan marketplace. It was started in 1996, um, somewhat naively with the notion that banks would actually be able to give uh, automated answers um, and real-time uh, risk-based pricing to consumers. Um, and uh, we operate in mortgage, home equity, auto loans, personal loans, and credit cards. A number of the, the new platforms are clients of ours, uh, which we're thrilled with. We uh, recently launched small business a couple weeks ago as well. And uh, I'm Jonathan Palin. I'm a head of institutional capital markets for, uh, for Lending Home, uh, which is uh, uh, streamlining the, um, the bridge financing for, uh, for, for rental real estate market. Um, prior to Lending Home, I was uh, head of institutional capital markets at, at Lending Club for the past five years um, and uh, a big advocate of uh, streamlining and simplifying you know, the whole, uh, whole financial process from, from start to finish. Cool. So now that we have a little bit of context on who are our panelists, I'm just going to go ahead and ask Kareem, why should we care? Right? Like, yeah. what is this marketplace lending thing and, and why is it important? Yeah, definitely. Well, lending overall generates $870 billion in annual revenue. Um, and so that's bigger than the automotive industry. It's bigger than the airline industry. It's bigger than both of those industries combined. And, um, and if you had uh, any guesses here on in terms of how much marketplace lending uh, accounts for in that? Any percentage guesses? 5, 10, 15? I say 0.1. <laughs> so it's 2% uh, that it accounts for right now. So we have a 98% addressable market opportunity, uh, revenue opportunity within, within the market lending place space. That's just, con that's just consumer, correct? The 860 yep. billion? Yeah. yeah. So I think that's why it's very relevant today uh, that we're here uh, as this industry is on the cusp of some major disruption with um, innovative companies that are on this panel. If you think about the industry as a whole, um, the, the banking sector or the traditional financing market has been one of the most stagnant industries over the past <laughs> you know, 50 years. Um, they're sleepy, they haven't been innovative, they're reluctant to change, um, and there's just massive inefficiencies that are embedded in there from overhead costs to, uh, to, to human capital to, uh, to, to legacy software and outdated systems. Uh, where you know, with just kind of streamlining the process and, and taking something that is overly, you know, overly complicated and stripping it down to its bare basics and making it simpler provides you know 
better deals for consumers, better returns for investors, and a more streamlined, efficient process overall. So, you know, it's not just consumer finance. I mean, any, any financing vertical um, from autom automotive to, to mortgages uh, to small businesses to, to aviation financing, um, you know, we're at the very cusp of a structural shift that you're going to see over the next 10 years. Um, and, you know, just as you know, Priceline and, and Orbitz did to travel and you know, Netflix did to, 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 did to movies, I mean, you're, you're going to see a, a massive structural shift that we're just, at, we're just starting to get a taste of what that looks like. And so what, what is the importance of data in this whole thing? I think Victoria <laughs> can tell us a little bit about that. Well, I think it's it's really all about the data. Um, with the adoption and the movement to the cloud over the last 10 years, businesses and also consumers are creating massive volumes of data in the cloud, right? And so Cabbage uh, is able to understand, to pull in, um, analyze, understand all of this data and use it to build profiles to understand the health of a business in a way that has never been possible in the past, right? So not only do we do it on the spot at the moment that we give the initial credit line, but also afterwards. So um, it's a persistent data connection. When you, it's not a one-time credit decision where you look at a, a business's tax statements, but you continue to monitor that business so that you can deliver more funds to it during key seasonality, or you know, in some occasions, reduce the line, and all of that is enabled by data. And it's, you know, there are many different classes of data from financial data that we leverage through Yodali and other partners to um, data that speaks more to customer service. So we look at social data, <coughs> review data, where we monitor things like how do you service your customers? Are you, you know, are you quick in responding? What's the overall sentiment? So it's, a, it's an incredibly broad range, um, and it is the heart of the Cabbage algorithm, is what we do with that data. Is that the same for Doug? It is. One of the, um, so when I started LendingTree, I started out of the, my own frustration getting a mortgage and getting the runaround from a bank. Um, but, ne but the dream was always to surround the customer with every type of loan that they have. So we recently launched something about a month ago called My Lending Tree, which think of it as kayak meets Amazon. So it's comparison shopping, but it's personalized based on your credit. And we're offering over 2,000 people a day a free credit. You can have access to your credit report. And then what we do is in the background, we mine your data, we pull your data, and we just send you an alert wherever we can save you money. So if you've got a 20% interest rate credit card, we give you a 15% interest rate, we do it. If you're a small business customer and we can save you money in something with one of our partners, so we're continuously polling, matching your data with the lender's data. And the idea was to make it, make you never have to even think about applying for a loan again, just sort of the set it and forget it uh, from, uh, you know, Ron Popeil of uh, Late Night TV. But that's what we wanted to do, where you just, um, we're just always on top of your situation. We can save you money, we do. And I want everybody in America to have a lending tree account at the end of the day. Data just allows us to make a much more educated and informed uh, decision process. Um, you know, what kind of, I would say, traditional financing companies uh, lack is, is, is aggregating and collecting the data that's available today, and, and it's not consistent with software systems that were developed in the 70s. Um, you know, it, it allows uh, you know, lenders to make much more informed, risk-based um, loans, and it allows consumers to get um, much more competitive loans that otherwise they, they wouldn't be able to get. So it, it really net net benefits everybody um, having this just uh, abundant sources of data uh, out there that's constantly being aggregated and, and collected. And so I, I have a question because Lending Tree is kind of like a little bit more upstream, right? So it's like a person who might or might not be thinking of getting a loan and doesn't really have access to it yet. And then Cabbage is a little bit further down that funnel, right, where they might be uh, ready to make that decision or they are already making that application. So where, where is the data more powerful? Who, who has a more valuable uh, picture of a customer at any given point? You go first. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that Cabbage, that I would say Cabbage is downstream because Cabbage is a line of credit and every business needs a line of credit behind them regardless of whether they need the funding right now, mm -hmm. right? So um, we have many businesses that sign up for a cabbage account, get approved for $100,000, but 
but if you're a retailer, you're not drawing against that money until now. This is kind of the, the busy time for retailers or advertising agencies in January. Yep. So it to me, it's 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 really a year-round process where every business needs access to capital. Um, it just will vary when they when they take money based on their particular vertical. Mm -hmm. um, so the original idea for Lending Tree was actually that you could create a full online transaction and close a loan. And that you could fill out a form on a blind basis, have lenders give you offers, pick the one that makes the most sense, because I fundamentally believe at the end of the day money's a commodity, although service matters, but money's fundamentally a commodity. Um, but very quickly, the first lenders who adopted us were entrepreneurial mortgage companies. And I remember getting a call from my first mortgage broker. He said, I got to talk to this guy. Like, I know you want me to do this on a blind basis, but he just filled out a $200,000 loan form and he wants to borrow $200,000. So he's a 100% LTV with a, you know, but his credit score doesn't get it. And he said, I got to talk to him. And, talk. and so it became less online. Um, but the fact that you still get your offers online, you can still comparison shop, you see ratings and reviews. And now that all these other great platforms have come along, I think the day where you can actually click a button and have money show up um, is close. And I believe that we're sitting in online lending where travel was, I love your comment about you know, Priceline and others, where they were in 2001, where all of a sudden when lenders needed customers, and in those days when airlines needed customers and hotels needed customers after September 11th, you had all the major companies flooding in and a lot of innovation. Um, and I believe online finance is going to be the largest but the latest sort of thing to, uh, to happen online. And so why do institutional investors care? I mean, you, you've seen, uh, like John in particular has seen, the whole cycle, right? Like from the early days at Lending Club where you had to really go and talk to a lot of institutional investors to get a little bit of money here and there, to the opposite where now there is a waiting list for institutional funds to get into these platforms. So what, what changed? What happened? Well, it, these platforms gave investors the first, for the first time access to this type of this type of risk and access access to the reward to, to the return that it generated. If you look at you know JP Morgan Chase's balance sheet or their earnings mm -hmm. statement, I mean sixty percent of their net income comes from the consumer 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 lending business, whether that's through credit cards or, or mortgages. Um, this is an asset class that banks have kept on their balance sheet, right? It's the one thing that they haven't sold off because it's such a it's such a profitable market. It's such a profitable opportunity, right? They're taking deposits in at, and, and, and paying 50 basis points, and then they're lending that out at you know 18, 19 percent through a credit card. That's a massive spread, and um, and for the first time, investors can have access to that spread um, without going through a securitization or through the EBS market, which you know just the structure alone eats up most of uh, of the spread and the return. So it, you know having access to this type of risk-adjusted um, investment opportunity has never been seen before. Um, and you know, the first couple of years were a big education process. You know, um, you know, it, it took a while before we got our first institutional investor on board. But once the concept was was validated, um, it, the floodgates opened. And I still think we're just at the very beginning of that. You know, that I used to say the best part about my job was, you know, you know I, it was like I had a, a stock idea for a mega cap stock that nobody knew the ticker, what the ticker was, right? You know, people thought I was calling when I was at Lending Club. They thought I was an after school program. <laughs> so, um, so it was, uh, it was, uh, you know, that was the best part about the job. But uh, institutions are starting to care. They will continue to care more once there's more public visibility, you know, um, with the Lending Club IPO being announced. Uh, but it, it's too big of a, uh, of a disruptive uh, product to, to ignore. So um, they will, they're starting to care, and that, that level will accelerate, you know, at an exponential rate, to, you know, in the future. So, well, what I was going to add to that is the other major element that changed to your change question is that companies like Cabbage have been able to demonstrate a better ability to manage risk to large institutional investors um, using all of this data. So for Cabbage, our first two, we raise our own debt that we then lend to businesses. Our first two raises for the debt were with um, venture investors, WTI, um, and uh, Victory Park Capital, and then this April, we raised a huge credit facility, $270 million, that was all 
through institutional investors, banks, insurance companies, and that was an oversubscribed round. Uh, all of it um, really, really centered on our ability to manage risk defaults through the data. So that's, that's the big change I see. And so, okay, so we have lots of changes. The banks are willingly or unwillingly opening up uh, their coffers, right, to one asset class that they kept really closely guarded uh, for a while. So what is the role that they're going to play in this revolution? Well, bank, you know, bank, banks are starting to realize that uh, they really can't compete with, with these platforms, so they might as well join, join them rather than get put, you know, put out of business completely. Um, you know, for instance, and what really um, for me is, is, the, is the big, is what truly demonstrates the magnitude of, of the disruptive nature of, of these platforms is the ability for, for banks or any type of financial institution to white label the technology. Um, for instance, you know, Lending Home or Lending Club, let's just say, to, for them to originate a loan, it costs them $50. For a bank to originate a loan, it costs them six, $700 or $7,000 if it's a mortgage. Um, you know, these platforms offer banks the opportunity to outsource their origination um, capabilities you know, to the origination platforms while still being able to fund the asset. So they're able to strip away all those costs that are associated with originating and underwriting while keeping, you know, the asset on their balance sheet. Um, for instance, so it could be a, a Titan bank loan that's powered by, by lending home. Um, so that, you know, that to me really demonstrates the, the, how big of an opportunity this could be. And this could be applicable to all verticals, whether it's mortgages, automotive, aviation, small business. Um, the technology was built to scale. Um, you know, it's not labor intensive at all. Um, so, you know, that's the way banks are participating and, and are kind of um, acclimating to, to the technology that's, you know. and, and, I, and I actually think most, um, probably have too much history in this, uh, but going back, if you go back about 10 years, um, I actually think home equity loans online were the first automated um, loan product. And if I, we used to have literally banks converting home equity loans with drive-by appraisals and automated underwriting, et cetera, um, very, very quickly. So I do think the banks will either white label or build over time their own technology. I always joke that bank, no bank wants to be first, but they all want to be second. Like they all need to rush into it um, at the same time once it's proven. And we're seeing a lot of banks have success with new technologies. At the same time, I think white labeling is a, is a great um, thing for them. But I think the banks are, at some point, they have to have an answer. Now, a lot of them have been burned. I talked to a major bank um, executive the other day, and he said, look, this installment loan business, we've done it. We lost 50% of our, of our earnings on these installment loans, like 50% of our book. Like, this just goes bad. So we haven't seen a credit. So this works for a credit cycle, and it may continue to work. But I think the really interesting thing for me is that we're getting to true risk-based pricing. Well, the thing that always struck me about lending is if I showed up at an insurance company, and I'm a 90-year-old woman, and I've never had an accident, like, I get a low rate. But if I'm a 25-year-old guy with three DUIs, I can still get insurance, just eight times more expensive. Um, and the same thing should be true in lending. It's just a matter of, of, of risk. And there's that's a, what I've been shocked. It's, there's, it's, a, there's a saying that there's no such thing as a bad, a, a bad loan, just, just bad, right. bad pricing. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, I'm, and so I think that's, to give every consumer access to credit, I was having this debate yesterday with some people about payday loans. I'm like, well, if we can give them multiple options on payday loans and one might be lower than the other, like, that's a good thing. Like, let's be a marketplace and, um, and then teach people how to improve their credit so that they become a better risk. And, and if you think about just what has been built with such a, in, in, in a relative aspect, you know, Lending Club has been able to kind of be the leader in, in, the, consumer, in the consumer online lending with two very small products, a three-year and a five-year straight-line amortizing installment loan. Yep. That's it, right? They're created a $5 billion company by these two relatively small you know, financial products that banks used to do all the time back in the day, and then it, it just wasn't efficient for them anymore. So you know, I, I think if you just keep that in mind while um, thinking about all the type of financial products that are out there, and how inefficient they are, uh, that, that's when it starts to kind of resonate how big this can be. What do you think? I think it's really interesting, uh, especially when you talk about banks and, um, and non-banks, how, they, how they're doing it. So uh, at Yodley, we talk to both banks and non-banks, um, and, uh, and we're seeing a lot of cool, innovative things come out of non-banks, um, obviously. Uh, so a lot of internet companies that are looking into getting into space 
uh, where they feel that the banks don't do a good job of serving as a market maker uh, the, in the way that they used to. Uh, they used to serve a huge um, you know, need in the community and now you don't have that as much uh, when you bring such an offline process online. You know, for instance, if you go to wellsfargo.com right now and you, if you don't have a checking or savings account with Wells Fargo, it'll bring up a sign that'll say, you know, uh, sorry we can't you know, fulfill this loan for you, please you walk your into your Wells Fargo <laughs> branch. Uh, that's just not uh, feasible anymore. Mm -hmm. So all these things need to come online and I think you guys are all doing a phenomenal job of doing that and really taking advantage of really great innovative uh, data sources. Um, I heard recently that uh, some companies are actually looking at how long people spend on the, the lending slider tool. So like, let's say it gives you an option between five and 50,000 to borrow. And you know, if someone comes in and just goes 50,000, let's go, you know, it's not gonna really take them that seriously. As someone who toggles between, let's say 30 and 35, spends a lot of time on them and then selects 32. So things like that, that banks just simply don't do because they want you to come into the branch and speak to them. But they cannot even do, right? Regulatory, um, they're bound by a yeah. set of different rules, right? Like exactly. What, uh, even if you go online like to, to Wells or just to Citibank, for instance, I mean, just their user interface, I mean, it, you, know, you, can't, you can't read it on your mobile phone. You can't, it, it's, it's, it's not pleasant to look at or fill out, you know, online, even at home where, you know, any of the, you know, newer platforms, it takes you three minutes to fill out an application and all they need is the last four of your social security number and they'll have an answer for you in under a minute. I mean, I'm a big fan of uh, Cabbage's uh, mobile app. Can Thank you. you. Yes. Tell us a little bit more about that one. Yeah, so we, Cabbage, uh, we launched our mobile app uh, last November and uh, in the first um, in the first six months that it was live, we put out twenty million dollars through it, um, which is so and growing uh, dramatically uh, every uh, every month. So um, I think it's I think it's a tremendous opportunity from a from a data standpoint. Uh, there's a whole host of mobile data that we're looking at incorporating into our algorithm for retailers. Things like mobile traffic patterns uh, is is you know a pretty interesting data point. So. Yes, getting back to mobility as a as a theme, it's um, it is it's incredibly powerful. So first we did it online, and now we do the same thing through mobile. But to your point earlier, Tabbage actually does deliver the funds instantly That's on the great. spot. So you are approved, and then you you know decide how much to take, and you say whether to deposit it into your bank account um, or PayPal, and then it's gone. So That's awesome. yep. So. If you if you had told me ten years ago though. 50% of our business would come from mobile, I would have never believed it. I mean, like, who's gonna fill out a form on a mobile device? But the new devices make it really easy. Um, and we launched a mobile app recently that I'll actually call it internally mortgage negotiator. It'll basically tell you all the other rates that other people are paying in the area who are just like you for mortgages and tell you whether it's a good deal or not. Now, obviously, we're hoping to give a customer service there, but we're also hoping that we can check your data and say, hey, we can beat that, uh, or one of our lenders can beat that. Um, and it just gives, and then when you think also of considered purchases, and I think loans are different than, say, maybe buying an airline ticket, you need to think about it. It's a multi-session, many times a multi-session sort of thing. Um, and I think that's where mobile can give you a really great immersive experience with the we're working on that, where you can come back again, or rates change, or your situation change, or we can send you an alert that this document was uploaded, et cetera. And I, I think you can actually make, we're sitting on the precipice of like the lending process actually being um, not this anxiety-ridden thing that we talk to customers. They literally talk about like cancer and paying taxes as uh, similar to getting a loan. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I think we're sitting in a good spot. It's becoming much, much less subjective and much more kind of rules-based. And I think the next big thing is getting from that, from mobile to the consumer's wallet. Is, is, is Cabbage coming out, um, like with a Cabbage like debit card or credit card that gives them instant access to the, <laughs> I, I don't that's me. <laughs> I, did, I know very little about Cabbage. I'm not a I, I like how you think. You, okay. are, you are right on track, okay, yes. Got it. You um, heard it here first, huh? Yes, <laughs> yes. And you, you can easily envision something like that for end users, uh, as well as, you know, for businesses kind of a pay with Cabbage mm -hmm. as they're going through and checking out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, while I was at Lending Club, a big conversation was, yeah, it, it's great when consumers get, get the loans, but, or get, get the funds, but what, what's really powerful is being in the consumer's wallet and having a, a branded 
car, uh, payment, you know, payment process, or payment mm -hmm. system. Okay, so we've talked about a lot of stuff so far. Um, what else can we talk about? Karim, can you tell us, okay, so we, we have a decent idea now of what's the basic use case of Yodli, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for some of these originators. Sure. Um, but then what are some other use cases? Like what, um, what do you see that is exciting that new startups or companies are using Yodli data yeah, for? Yeah, definitely. So we have a whole host of small business lending companies on our platform. Uh, that um, use our, our account verification API uh, to just instantly verify accounts. So all the user needs to put in is their bank login credentials, and we are able to pull an account number, routing number, name on the account, and verify that account owner. Uh, and then uh, you can uh, double click on that account and uh, look at all of the, the, account, the balances associated with it. So see if there's any negative balances that they've had in the past, any NSFs uh, that they've had to pay for, um, and then if they have a positive balance, um, see over time if the balances are declining. So I'm seeing a lot of, um, of companies look at that, that closely. And then you can go further into that by looking at the transactions on those accounts. So not only your checking account, your small business checking account, but also um, your personal checking account, your, um, your, your small business credit card, your loans. It's very interesting for them to see uh, other loans that you might have. So they can pull that up uh, using the same bank login credentials that they gave us. To have a better picture of their debt to income ratio. And, exactly. And that sort of stuff. Exactly. Uh -huh. Yeah. And I think that's just fascinating. I, I, did, I didn't imagine it to be a use case at all a year and a half ago. And now it's probably one of our, uh, it, it's definitely our fastest growing market segment in terms of being our largest. It definitely has the potential to be. If you, you know, look at all of the different uh, things associated with lending. You know, you have SMB lending, consumer lending, mortgage lending, uh, purchase finance. Uh, it definitely, you know, I definitely have it poised to be our largest market segment by the end of this year. And so, when 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 I think of some of these uh, platforms, you guys have had to build all of this intelligence in house, right? And now it's part of your core uh, capability, right? As, as a as a platform, Cabbage, like. This was esoteric uh, a couple yep. of years ago, and now there are going to be providers that are going to be offering this as a standard uh, product that they offer via an API. So where do you see this going? Like, do you think that this becomes a core part of the uh, platform in itself, or are a lot of these things going to start getting peeled away and what's left after it? Anyway. I think it's... I think it's I think it's similar to what kind of Facebook did with their API and using Facebook logins and, and you know really kind of yeah. made growth go exponential. I think it's going to take a, a, a similar path where the technology in itself is going to become a product that's separate from the core offering as well. And I actually think what I've always been fascinated by is that first off over 17 years watching trends change, how every lender sees things a little differently, and some people are going to make underwriting decisions based on like time on you know, log time on the slider. Mm -hmm. Somebody else is going to make it based on a FICO score. Somebody else is going to make it based on a complex algorithm. Clearly, costs are going to come down. Um, traditional banks are going to do one thing. Like right now, the trend in banking is I don't care about um, getting new customers. I just want to get more wallet share. So, um, and banks tend to move in hertz. But what I always think is interesting is how a marketplace, like everybody sees it differently. Um, just like obviously the stock market, and um, and that's what we hope to do, which is to give any individual lender, any individual platform customers that meet their criteria at the time that um, that they are. And I, it's fascinating to me to talk to one lender and have them say one thing, and then talk to another lender and have them say like something 180 degrees opposite of what I just heard. I'm like, great, like you can do that too. Um, we'll just help you target in on what you're looking for. And, and the big thing of what we're working with at Lending Home and what Lending Club's done a great job is standardizing that process and, and, not, and, and making a, a Lending Club loan or a Lending Home loan um, not be subjective and not have different viewpoints, but really have it be kept to the same standard. Like you know what you're getting when you buy a Lending Home loan or a Lending Club loan or you're investing in cabbage. Right? You, you know what you're getting. It's becoming a standardized process, and I think that's just part of the, the adoption curve and, and validation of the, of the system. We at Cabbage, we have been opening up access to our platform, our underwriting platform, and in fact, we announced yesterday that we doubled our 
monthly or our daily lending volume in the last six months, and much of that, from one to two million, much of that is coming from opening up the platform to um, other financial institutions, uh, and some of it is private labeled, some of it is referral, there are a whole host of arrangements, but I think you're gonna see much more of that, of taking this, the technology, which is such an asset, and the platform, and expanding reach to more people, more businesses, more consumers through those platforms. That's, that's how you get real exponential growth, right? I mean, that's, it's free distribution, it's free sales and marketing, and it, it, it's really growth at, at the umpteenth power. Um, yeah. so, so where do you keep finding those new customers? Because that, that becomes a, a big, big question, right? Oh, challenge. man, you know, we, uh, the, in the small business space, um, about 40% of small businesses seek funding every year, and about 50% can't get access to it. So it's, and there are 28 million small businesses in the US, you know, lots of people do math on what portion of them is credit worthy, but let's assume 12 million. Those are some pretty big numbers, and it's not just one time, but all businesses, whether you are a venture capital or you are a restaurant, all businesses need capital to grow. So it's a recurring need that keeps happening. It's not a one time. In fact, with um, Cabbage, our customers actually use us on average seven times a year. So they keep coming back and taking loans to um, invest in uh, expanding a website, a marketing campaign. So it's recurring. Can you talk about the refinancing that goes into that? Uh, from the customer point of yeah. view, can you clarify. Can you clarify yeah, the question? So like, yeah. So let's say I'm I'm on uh, Cabbage and I yeah. already have a loan on there, and mm -hmm. let's say I want to go in for my second or third loan. Mm -hmm. uh, are there refinancing options right then and there? Oh no, it's not. It's not refinancing. Okay. So Cabbage gives you a line. So say we give you a hundred thousand mm -hmm. uh, dollars, and then you draw against that line, and you can draw multiple times a year. So generally, you you may take if you take. $10,000, you can keep taking the other 90 whenever gotcha. you want. But if you take the full 100, you need to repay it. Uh, and as you start repaying it okay. monthly, that line size opens up and then you can keep taking more money. Gotcha. Is Cabbage, gotcha. Take, how is, is cabbage taking the origination fee? What's, what's no, the actually, line? so no, great question. Um, we do not, no origination fees and no prepayment penalties. It's meaning that our loans are structured as six months but if you pay back in three or four, uh, like a lot of retailers do because their needs are actually short term, they tend to buy inventory, resell it, make the money, then you do not accrue mm -hmm. any interest for those extra months. So, so Cabbage is earning the, the spreading of Yes, okay. yep, so it's, it's, it's interest and no other fees whatsoever. So in terms of marketing, what I always find interesting um, is still the number of underserved customers and still the spread of lenders, so you take Personal loans on Lending Tree have obviously just taken off over the last few months because guys like Lending Club and Prosper and others, we've got 11 personal loan lenders on our network, but I still find that rates are literally not 20 percentage points, but 20% between the low and the high, and we still have half of the customers under that yep. fall on the floor. Yep. Um, there's still so many opportunities. Like the customers will find it, and we believe they want a comparison shop. Um, and, um, and they can comparison shop across different platforms, different lenders, traditional lenders, et cetera, et cetera, see ratings and reviews. Um, but it still has always struck me, and we found the same thing in mortgages early on. The average response time early on in lending crew is five days. You fill out a form, you get a response five days later. And then I made up the best practices manual and taught lenders that you had to do it instantaneously. Um, but the, the, the shocking thing to me is, how different everybody sees the market and the fact that there's so many customers still um, underserved. Well, that's what's great about lending home is that you get, we can close on a loan in three days, not just get, a, I don't know, yeah, get approved in, in under a minute and close on a loan that's in amazing. three days. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're almost there. We probably have a minute or two for questions from our gracious audience. So, anyone? Yes. Shout it out. I, 
I think it's a very significant opportunity. We're actually right now um, speaking with a major bank partner about opportunities in Africa. Africa tends to be um, obviously very strong in mobile usage, mm -hmm. and there are some great opportunities there to reach more users through through mobile. So I think it's a, it's a very significant opportunity. Yeah. I, I think it will be a little bit of time before you start to see, um, I mean, the platforms have to be educated about those markets and, and those demographics um, as, as well as they are about, you know, the U.S. market for um, kind of, you know, putting investors capital at, at risk. So I, I think it's, it, it, will, it will be there in time, but, but they're, sure. they're, they're just starting to get, you know, the U.S., right? And there are thousands of platforms, so I think China has probably a couple thousand yeah. uh, lenders in, in that shadow banking uh, space. Um, and at least from an investor perspective, I talked to probably three to five new platforms that are coming online, uh, whether it is in the US or the UK, uh, increasingly Latin America, Africa, Eastern Europe, it's just popping up everywhere. Um, it seems that everybody has uh, started to notice that you can do a lot of good um, in a relatively short amount of time uh, for a lot of people. So yeah, it's gonna it's gonna come in time. Come on, one more. Yeah. Um, so the underserved actually find you. It, it, it's uh, something in the industry known as adverse selection, which um, when you need credit, you seek it out. When you generally don't need it, it finds you. Uh, so we have thousands and thousands of people coming in across the loan products every day that can't, um, that can't satisfy that. The way I think we need to do it is by educating them about credit and their uh, credit worthiness and then helping them improve over time. So our new My Lending Tree product basically says, all right, your credit score is, like I always feel we should, we should be honest, like your credit score is 600, like that sucks. But if you, <laughs> if you pay off these three lines and you do this and you do that and you do that, it's gonna go up 20 points um, and then we get you to 620 and then you can now not get a 19% car loan, you can get a 14% car loan. Or and you can refinance that or you can you know, actually afford a, afford a house. Um, so I think it's really about giving people tangible ways that they can improve and then also bring, finding any lender or any platform that we can who's willing to serve them um, and just be a transparent marketplace. So like, I mean, we have, a lender might offer a 50% interest rate, but you know what, like if that's the best you can get and you compare it against a 60% interest rate, um, it's better. So I think as these more and more automation comes in, everybody's gonna be able to get a loan. Um, we're just going to pay different rates, and that's not necessarily bad. I mean, we, you know, people like to bash, oh, it's subprime this, subprime that. You know what? Like, if that's the reality, that's the risk. It is the risk. But I think as more, the neat thing that I'm finding is, you've got institutional money that's willing to take risk, and it's finding the customer who's willing to borrow the money, um, and capital flows. And um, it's, it's, it's been neat to watch and neat to see how customers now, instead of like five day response time, they get it instantaneously and banks have to actually treat you like, or another lender has to treat you like a customer instead of treating you like a, like a piece of cattle. I, I think the underserved or the underbanked, if, if that's what you're referring to, that really needs to come from a structural, structural change. There are really kind of the, the alternative financial services or AFS, if you will. Um, I mean, they really only have one option and that's like check cash and outlets, right? And you know, th those are, you know, probably, I mean, that's just a disgrace, I think, to, 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 to America. I, th there needs to be a change there, in, in my view, to, to, to how the underserved and underbanked are treated and the pricing that they're given. Um, you know, that's, that's a very kind of, uh, they're, they're highly taken advantage of in, 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 in those respects. And a lot of that is tied to regulatory issues as well. One more, last one. Nope, okay, I think we're good then. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much guys, thanks Kareem. Uh, thanks everyone for- Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.